All right, hello, and welcome to yet another Value Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. And with me today, I'm excited to have uh, Shamik Ghosh, aka Minion Capital. Shamik, how are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me on, Andrew. A uh, huge fan of yet, yet another Value Blog. I've uh, been reading it for uh, a long time and, and also have really enjoyed these, these podcasts that you've been doing recently. So thanks for having me on. Hey, I, I appreciate that. And let me, let me just turn it right around and start the podcast the way I do every podcast, and that's by pitching you. You know, uh, it's funny. I, I think I've been following Minion Capital, your, your kind of alternative Twitter handle for three years. And as I was telling you before the pod, I, at first, I just thought you were a guy who was running a, a really SAS focused uh, personal account. And I really appreciate a lot of your insights, but I was like, oh, okay, you know, this is just a home gamer who's got a lot of knowledge. And then over the years, people were like, no, you don't get it. Like this guy is actually a really sharp VC who really knows what he's talking about. And some mutual friends were even like, he really helped me with a lot of S software as a service stuff. So, you know, I I've loved your Twitter account as an anonymous thing. I always knew you were sharp, but then you find out, oh, like there, there's kind of a reason behind this. So everyone should be following you, really enjoyed all of your stuff. And uh, that out the way, you know, why don't you give us some background on you and how you came into investing, VC, all that type of stuff? Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. One just started the uh, anonymous account a while ago. Um, uh, more is just, you know, I, I'd seen, I'd met Bluegrass and, and a couple of the other uh, um, early FinTwit folks. And I thought it was just exciting to kind of do it anonymous and just get the uh, 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 things out there and started tweeting about SaaS, uh, met a lot of really great people. Um, and then I, I, you know, when I joined my most uh, recent firm where I'm at, which is, which is called Bold Start Ventures, and I can describe a little bit more about what we do. Yeah, but then I was great. like, okay, well now actually I think it's, it's time for me to start like a real uh, Twitter account. So I'm at showmickghost21. Um, uh, and there really I tweet more about kind of true enterprise software, engineering blog posts, um, uh, things that I'm thinking about in terms of, you know, enterprise software startups. But really what, what, what you know, what I do is I, I like to just invest in great business models. And so one of the things that drew me to enterprise software and specifically the, the infrastructure niche, which, which I would say I, I mostly focus on, um, is the mission criticality of this software, right? So if you're running uh, your, your, your database and you're, you're running on MongoDB, that is something that's really hard to rip out. Like if you think about it, Amazon transitioned off of Oracle databases and it took them, I forget how long, but like it was a huge deal when they finally uh, tweeted out the picture of like, hey, our last fulfillment center is no longer running on Oracle database, right? And so it, these sticky mi mission criticality, uh, mission critical software companies and products are really interesting to me. So that's kind of why I got interested in, 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 uh, in sort of infrastructure and, and enterprise software. And, and at Boltstar, basically we are, um, you know, pre-product or early in product investors in uh, technical founders building for the enterprise. So everything we do is trying to identify uh, uh, founders who have you know, kind of an opinionated view of how that world should evolve and then have, have ideas in terms of uh, uh, how the product should form um, and, and, and how, they sh how they can best serve kind of the end user. In this case, a lot of our cases is, is developers. So that's where we like to focus and, and that's where my passion is. And, and that translates over to my PA as well and, and my personal investing stuff. So let me ask you a little bit more about the difference between like your, your day job as a VC investor and kind of your night job as in investing in public portfolios. Cause like, you know, I think four years ago, I think it was really under misunderstood among public equity investors that, Hey, when you've got something like an Amazon web service, just how sticky it could be, uh, how much pricing power there could kind of be there, all this type of stuff. Right. But I do think most people looked at it and said, Oh, like this is sticky. It's probably going to be a good business once say at scale. When you're making these VC bets, you know, you're, you're investing much more in the person and yeah, they can come and say, Hey, I've got a vision, but you know, I could come to you and say, Hey, I've got a vision of building this great SaaS product. I, I have no background doing it. Like I can describe the perfect vision, but I, I'm obviously not the person to execute it. How do you balance those two or kind of, how do you focus more on the person as a VC versus, you know, somebody just pitching a great business model or finding a great business model in the public markets? Yeah. So, so I would say, um, you know, there's a lot of corollaries between both. Right. And um, in a lot of it at the beginning point, again, like you said, you're investing in people um, and, and people will pivot like the great one of the one of my favorite stories is, is Slack. Right. It started off as a gaming company. Right. And then they had this this sort of it's, it's straight out like halt and catch fire where, you know, they're a gaming company. Then all of a sudden they see this uh, uh, chat feature taking off and they're just like, huh, maybe we should do something there. Right. And then they pivot and then now they're Slack. Right. And, and, and that's just like fascinating to me. Like where else can you do that besides uh, early stage, you know, early in product investing and be able to just truly bet on people 
but, but see something kind of special in the way that they think, um, how they think about products, what their product intuition is, um, and then also how they're thinking about the components like that actually drive that product, right? What, what, what are the architecture trade-offs that they're like, we're gonna make these. And so like, um, I don't know if you've, you've heard of a company called Superhuman, but basically it's, it's lightning fast email. Um, and when you look at Superhuman, it's really funny because like there's little nuances that you wouldn't really, it's hard to pick up on, but the design is super simple. Like it's, there's not many buttons, everything's keyboard based. It's like an Excel or, or, or coding experience, right? You don't need to touch the mouse. And that is purposely done. He literally went through and, and literally marked up Gmail and was like, we don't need this, we don't need this, like slash those off. And that was his initial product idea, Rahul's product idea, was just slashing Gmail components, right? Um, and then if you think about the trade-offs he's making, every single time it's all about speed. And so when they, when they introduce a new feature, they're like, well, how much does this inject latency into the process, right? And if, if it does, then like, how do we rejigger the architecture to make sure that that doesn't happen, right? And so those sort of product thinking is what gets us really excited because if someone is that deep in the weeds and, and, and that thoughtful about it, even if they pivot, they're gonna be able to figure out a, a new way to expand the product. And so now if you take that to the, to the public market side, it's not like, yeah, we have more metrics to go off of, but it's still based on that intuition, right? Um, because if you take a company and sure, like Zoom is a great example. For me, that's one where I kind of struggle with because yep. they have a great video product that's ramping really quickly. Um, but, but that video product is ramped so quickly that now they have to expand into adjacent markets. And my question is, okay, well, how are they gonna expand into those adjacencies? And you know, one way is they're kind of taking on Ring Central in the phone space, right? And I think that will do pretty well. They have Zoom rooms. So like they're doing stuff that are, that are in those adjacent categories. But I still think it's a little bit too early kind of to understand really, you know, what's that, what's that product intuition that they're, gonna, that they're gonna bring to like a whole new sort of product and expand their TAM and expand uh, uh, their, their surface area with customers. So those are sort of the ways that I think about when I'm public investing derived from the, uh, the private side. No, and I just love that you lo you did Zoom and Superhuman because a as we were prepping for this podcast, I obviously went and looked at uh, looked at all the VC investments you guys made, and I saw Superhuman on there, and I was like, good good for them. But you know, you use Zoom and Superhuman, and those are two that I think a lot of people would not have bet on because you know Zoom, even if it's a better product, like you have Google Hangouts, Google Meet, there's Skype, like there were plenty of ways to do uh, there were plenty of ways to do video online. And full disclosure, we're talking over a Zoom call right now. And, you know, superhuman, like everyone would look at that and say, uh, Gmail is free. Like, what, why are you investing in an email app? So I, I just think it's interesting, like the vision, the skew, right? If these things break huge, they're going to they're gonna be huge. And uh, yeah, no, I, I just think those are super interesting. Let me, let me ask a little bit more about the public portfolio. So you do this thing on uh, your Twitter where I think once every three months or so, you publish the coffee can portfolio, right? And I'll, I'll let you describe the coffee can. Why don't you describe the coffee can portfolio and then I have a couple questions on that. Yeah. So, so, uh, so by the way, like w when I say coffee can, it, it sounds like maybe some other people had different views on, on what it was, but the way that I uh, uh, think about it is basically, um, you know, what are kind of the, the, the core components of portfolio that you wouldn't want to change for, let's say, I, I'll say a three to five year time frame, right? Like if you didn't have to touch it, would you be okay owning those businesses? And for me, that's, um, uh, that's where I get excited, right? Uh, and, and so I constantly kind of refreshing that because at certain times, um, uh, I think companies are going through phase shifts, they're going through transitions, they're, they're introducing new products or the competitive positioning is changing. And so even within a, a, a shorter time frame of three months, there could be something that all of a sudden, something that was on the bottom of your list may have just actually gotten a little bit more interesting and moved to the top of that list because of like the dynamic, like they just introduced a new product that you're just like, wow, Oh my God, like I can see how this could just, you know, open up a whole new vertical for them. And, and, and I could see the attach rates between this product that would really make it expand quickly. Right. And so that's where uh, the coffee can portfolio is just basically what's my core watch list or core positions I own that I wouldn't touch for the long term. And then I'm constantly kind of adjusting those as, as uh, you know, things play out. Yeah. No, I love the idea. And you know, it's something, it's so funny, like until a couple months ago, I didn't even know who, who was behind the Minion Capital account and then Jerry Capital. I still have no clue who's behind that account, but you two have kind of been really instructive for me. And like, Hey, if you own a great business, you, you believe in it, you've got a great understanding of it. Even if it looks a little expensive in the near term, like it's often best just, just to hold through that because like, you're not going to buy something at well, maybe you will like Shopify, which we'll talk about in a second. You're not going to buy something at 50 cents. But you know, if you think it's worth 20 times earnings and it's trading for 22, save the headache, 
keep it. And if you've got great managers, oftentimes, as you said, they'll kind of ladder into other things. And it's one of the lessons I've really learned from you. But you know, when I look at your coffee can portfolio, it's interesting because you've got uh, AMT, that's towers, uh, cell phone towers, Amazon, everybody knows them, CSU, Canadian software kind of roll up, Costco, you know, Amazon and Costco on the same list is a little interesting. Facebook and IAC, which I love, but there's also uh, Nike's on the watch list. So how do you balance all these different types of things you're looking at? Yeah, I mean, for me, from the public side, right, I have a day job that I have to focus on. And so, uh, you know, for me, like, let's, Herbalife is never going to be something I ever look at. Uh, and, and part of the reason why is there's just too hard of a cognitive load for me to understand, like, that, that battleground stock, who's right and who's wrong. And there's a ton of money to be made, by the way, on both sides. But, like, it's just not for me, right? So, for me, it's all about um, decreasing that cognitive load. So, if I can't understand a story of a company really quickly... Um, then frankly, it just goes in the too hard pile and I just move on. There's enough companies and enough quality businesses out there that I should be able to understand them uh, just by, by going through it quickly. And so that's where my first filter. So I would say, you know, uh, all these kind of have similar dynamics. Like if you think about distribution, um, it's a powerful concept that, that goes through from software to grocery stores, right? Shelving and, and, and getting, uh, buying your, having tied on the middle row eye level in, in a grocery store, that's distribution, right? And you're paying for that slotting fee to get in front of the consumer um, uh, or Costco getting your product in a certain case makes you uh, on, into a cer certain shelf that's in front of the consumer. Like those are all distribution concepts that still apply to software. There's a yep. way of like, you're trying to get in front of the consumer or the end user or the customer, right? And how can you do that? And so I think these are these powerful mental models that you just, once you get them, you can kind of start to see the corollaries between like different high quality businesses. And then just, it makes it a lot easier. On the distribution thing, you know, one of the spaces I spend most of my time is looking at media and cable companies. And uh, there's been a huge short case on Netflix for years, right? And I, unfor to my detriment, I've never invested in it because I did always think it was expensive. And I did always think there was a lot of competition there. But I, I could never imagine how you could short something where the Netflix home screen is the best distribution spot in the entire world. I would say bar none, maybe if you're a product and you get on the Amazon home screen, but even that, I really think it's Netflix. Like you look at what they can do with something like Cobra Kai, where it's an also ran on YouTube and then they put it on Netflix and everyone's going crazy for it. Like they can make hits and it just shows that distribution. They've got power that no one else in the world has. And it's, it's, it's really funny that you bring that up. Cause like Netflix is one that again, that's, that's a, a huge mistake of omission on my part. And I still, I still, frankly, to this day, have trouble with the, the steady state cash flow dynamics and just understanding how that, that, how the competition matures in that, in that area. But, but yeah, exactly. The distribution concept is there. Um, and then, and then also it's, it's this concept of, you know, uh, this, this frictionless experience, right? So turning on Netflix is so much easier. And you think about the UI of Netflix compared to Amazon Prime. I don't know if you've, you've looked at both, but like, it's just, oh, yeah. it's like night and day, right? Like trying to, trying to navigate through your Amazon Prime video. It's, it's like horrible. It's a horrible experience. If you use, if you use Disney plus, uh, so I love star Wars and, uh, I heard really good things about Clone Wars. So I've been doing star Wars. I'm like, one thing I've noticed is if I watch an episode to the end and, you know, I normally try to like watch an episode and stop. And then I want to go to the next, the next time I open up the app, it'll have me watch the last, it'll open up to the end of that last episode, like in the credits, instead of auto starting on the next credits. And yeah, that seems small and seems stupid, but like Netflix doesn't do that type of stuff, you know, and it, 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 there's just a lot of stuff there. What about, uh, so your BC, you know, I, I, I think uh, as we talked about, it's no longer, everyone knows now like kind of SaaS companies, enterprise companies, all this are, you know, they're the, they're the dream. They're what you're looking for. They're what every VC is trying to firm. So how does, uh, how do you, at Bullsart, how do you guys kind of get an edge or is there any like kind of differentiating thinking around that that you have? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say we're, we're, we're pretty focused in our niche. So when we say enterprise software, I would say, you know, uh, most of the stuff we do is actually in infrastructure. Um, or uh, in the application stack. And in the application stack, we have um, certain, you know, kind of really opinionated product views that we look for, like Rahul or like uh, uh, Brad and Jeremy at Customer with a K, which is going up against Zendesk and Salesforce. Like there's certain things that we look for that, um, you know, make us comfortable uh, uh, backing these founders in, in, these, in these kind of reimagining an existing category. But then a lot of areas in infrastructure are actually completely kind of new categories, right? Category creation. Um, and and that, that requires maybe a, a, a different lens in terms of the founder that you're looking for and the product intuition and, and, and the pain point that they lived. And so everything has to kind of stem from like, have they lived the pain point? Do they understand the workflow of the end user? Do they understand the different um, uh, components of an organization? So for example, if you're a developer tool, your end user may be a developer, 
But then you also have a technical buyer or a technical decision maker um, who may be like an engineering manager. And then you also probably have a buyer who might be uh, maybe even someone who's outside of the engineering manager. Maybe it's in the finance org or something, right? Like there's all these different components and that human coordination problem of trying to figure out like, okay, well, if I get the end user love, if I get the developer to, to love me and use my product, how does that matriculate to them buying? is a super interesting process that again, we're looking for people who have, who have you know, been through that pain point, understand that, so they can start to kind of figure out how am I gonna deliver value, not only to the end user, but also to the manager and to the finance person and to all these different components. Um, and so that's the kind of model we use. Is over time, like obviously every, I think it's not, not overplayed, but everyone knows like delighting the end user is one of the most important KPIs at this point, but are you finding over time that delighting the end user is getting more and more important. You know, I think about something like Slack, which was getting literally pulled into enterprises because everyone was using Slack. So eventually the CIO had to use it. Do you find that's happening in kind of some of your startups? Yeah, I would say that's that's one of the biggest components, right? Um, and, and, you know, it's something we'll, we'll talk about because I think there are certain products that um, are, are much more of a, a CIO or CTO type of decision process. Um, a lot of security kind of falls into that. Um, when that when that changes, right? Sneak is now a two point six billion dollar uh, uh, company um, in our portfolio, and, and one of the ways that they actually thought about was, well, what if we uh, enable developers to use open source code securely? And 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 then now they're becoming basically a de developer security platform company, right? That that's moving to adjacent uh, uh, products. But w when you when you go into something like security, typically that has been CIO focused, and there's still a lot of things like CISO focused there's still a lot of areas that still probably do resonate more with the CISO than it would with the end user. And that's still a fine vertical to go into. The only thing is at that point, then you need to align your cost structure. So if you're going in to sell to a CISO or CTO or this top down level sale, um, what you want to do then is make sure that, you know, it's going to be long, longer sales cycles. Yep. Uh, you're going to have a direct sales force. And so that's going to be a little bit costlier in sort of that way. Right. Um, and, and so you just got to make sure that like, okay, well then our, our average contract value, right. Our ACVs that we're going to target are going to be much higher and our price point is going to be much higher. Right. Versus if you're serving end users actually can go in and do something that's much more uh, consumptive, like, and, 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 um, uh, you know, like, like a Spotify subscription or something like that, yep. where you're like, hey, you have different plans. So, you know, you pay $10 for this. If you want to add on another user to your account, you pay $15. And then if you want to have access across all of your devices, you pay $20 or something like that, right? And, and that's much more of a uh, something that's starting to happen more at the end user level uh, when you're targeting those end users. But again, the, that cost structure then shifts because then you can't have a huge sales force uh, going after these, you know, a uh, uh, hundred dollar contracts from different developers, right? Because yep. otherwise then you, you'd go bankrupt. And so it's, it's, it's something that I start to evaluate, especially at the public markets. When I see a mismatch in that cost structure, that makes me run the other way. Or I'm trying to understand why, is, why are the founders or why are, why are the, uh, the management team going with that cost, stru cost structure? Are they seeing something in the future that, that uh, means they need to go and chase uh, uh, the product that way? Can you think of a company uh, in the public markets, or it could be private markets, that that you see that mismatch in terms of, hey, we've got these hundred fifty thousand plus Salesforce guys out here who are chasing these hundred dollar accounts down? <laughs> you know, I I, I can I, I um uh you know I'd rather I'd rather not go into it, but I I just would I just would say like I think there's um you know that's one of the most interesting things in SaaS right now is when these companies go public, uh, they're all trading at pretty large multiples. And, uh, and I don't think there's enough investors that are really kind of doing that alignment, uh, um, alignment of cost structure sort of uh, uh, deep dive, right? And, and so there's a bunch of companies, like for example, if they're saying, hey, we serve end users uh, uh, and, and we're, we have viral adoption, but then they have um, you know, uh, a large S&M expense and then they're saying about their direct sales team and stuff like that, you should then start to kind of dive in a little bit deeper and be like, okay, like what's happening here, right? And we'll go into like having a direct sales team and having a bottoms up funnel is not a bad thing. Like most companies will eventually go into that, but you should be able to see how it's working in the financials, right? Because the, the load in terms of uh, acquiring new customers will not be that huge. Like if you look at Datadog versus uh, Anaplan, you'll see very different models and very different cost structures in those two businesses that can help you kind of better triangulate when you look at a new company. Yeah, the, the two I think about is Dropbox, which, you know, it's mainly students and individuals versus something like Box, which is going after Absolutely. giant corporations. And uh, yeah, uh, let's see. Let, 
end game for your company. So we've talked a lot, you, you're normally investing in these infrastructure things. And generally I think like when you're investing in those things, eventually the, the end game is probably a roll up by someone bigger. Is that how you think about the end game for most of your companies? Or do you think these things just grow forever? IPO, maybe get taken out by a stack at 500 times sales, something like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, I, I would say every single company has a different uh, end game, right? Because it's all based on, uh, on 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 the TAM that they're targeting, on on how they're able to expand into adjacencies. Um, you know, I think Modest just did a um, uh, a talk with on on Invest Like the Best, the podcast yep. that's out there. Um, and one of the things that he brought up was was really kind of expanding the TAM, right? And that's such an, a useful thing, especially when multiples right now are as high as they are. The companies that have the ability to expand to product adjacencies and expand their market that they're addressing. Um, should be worth actually a larger multiple, right? And when everything's trading at the same multiple, that's actually probably how you can drive some alpha. And so, um, you know, what we're looking for is in, in our companies, um, for them to uh, take the, the end user love, right? The developer love that they have or, or the customer love that they have, and then start to expand into product areas after they've reached, you know, a certain level of scale such that they can invest in that through, through the org, right? And so that becomes much more of a, like, a capital allocation decision rather than uh, actually, you know, a, a, a necessarily product decision. Um, it's much more of like, okay, well, you know, at 10 million of ARR, we probably don't have the money to, we still need to stay on our core vertical, but maybe at 30, we now can free up a couple of resources with some spend, especially with, with people paying forward on our, on our uh, ARR uh, estimates. Um, yep. You know, we can start to invest in some of these new uh, product areas and, and we, we can almost have like a tiger team that's working on this, right? And so if you're able to do that, then like Sneak, for example, you know, the goal there right now is they're gonna be a public company, right? Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully a, a fairly large one, and they will be the standalone developer security company that exists in the, in, the, in the public markets, which doesn't exist right now. There's no developer security company right now, they're all top-down sales, right? So that's a pretty powerful thing um, where, you know, their exit should be being a large public company. Um, some other companies, maybe they get bought, maybe they get rolled up, maybe they uh, go public. You know, there's a bunch of different ways and it just depends on the market. No, and you know, one of the things I think that's most fun about like th this space is a lot of it is your creativity, right? Like if I came to you and I pitched, uh, hey, Superhuman, we're just gonna be a great email service. I'd be like, you know, A, I, I originally would have thought there's a lot of competition there as we discussed, you know, Gmail, Outlook, all that sort of stuff. But if that was the whole business, I probably wouldn't do it. But if you start really like dreaming, right? Like superhuman, hey, we're gonna own all of these people's uh, emails. And if we do it really well, like you could almost break even on the email and make all of your money on all sorts of other things. You know, you could expand into customer, customer relationship management because you own all of their emails. You could expand, like there's just so many different things. And one of the things I love about these spaces is if you can get really creative, like there are these, I, I believe Modest called and invest like the best, these ladder up opportunities, right? Where you have this one thing and you almost don't even need to be profitable. And Open Door, we talked about on our last podcast, if they can dominate home buying, if they could just break even that, maybe they can make all their money on title services and mortgages or something. So that's one of the things. Um, last question for you on this, and then I want to switch over to Shopify. Capital allocation, you know, like when you're talking VC bets where, uh, you know, a, probably the base case is a zero and the upside case is 100, 200, 300x versus your per, your personal portfolio of investing in uh, public market companies, which, you know, a lot of these SaaS companies have gone up 10x or 15x, but it's a much different risk reward. How do you think about balancing between the two? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I would say uh, the way I kind of look at everything is, is relative valuation and then absolute valuations. And so for me, um, it, especially in the public markets, uh, um, relative valuations I pay attention to. And so, for example, right now, when everything's trading really high, um, uh, like I may actually still, even though people will be like, oh, Datadog's trading at a nosebleed multiple and it's, and it's higher than everything else. Well, for the quality of that, that business and how they're expanding to adjacent categories, maybe that's actually one of the cheapest companies out there compared mm -hmm. to you know, uh, some other, what I perceive as lesser quality company, but still trading at, you know, a 20 X ARR multiple. Right. And so that's where I think, um, uh, you know, that's the relative aspect to it. And then the absolute aspect is, okay, well, if this company is a $10 billion market cap, um, well, what's the market that they're, that they're, that they're targeting. We'll talk about this with Shopify, but like, you know, uh, uh, Shopify right now is like a hundred billion dollar market cap. But if you have six or 7% market uh, share of, of the, uh, of the U S e-commerce business, I mean, I don't know. What if that share doubles and goes to 14%, right? Like what if that, what if that in the future gets to 30%?
Yeah. Right? What is that worth? And, 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 and that's the kind of way to think about it. And then you start to have to handicap, well, what's the ability for them to gain that market share? What's the ability for them to capture more of that, that TAM or expand their TAM so that they can capture more market share in other areas, right? And so that's a constant analysis where, you know, from an absolute valuation, actually something that is trading at a high relative valuation could be really cheap. Um, you just have to lengthen your time frame, which then starts to, t uh, starts to kind of bring into opportunity costs and, and different other variables as well. But that's kind of where I think about from a, uh, from a public market perspective. Yeah. W one company that I've written about a little bit this week and uh, I, I just absolutely love right now is Angie, Angie's List Home Advisor. And, uh, you know, I just think about that and they're attacking home services, right? And like, yeah, it's a difficult flywheel to get going, but if you can be the dominant person in getting plumbers, electricians, carpenters, like basically any home remodeling done, like that, that market is so big and there's so much level op opportunities there. And uh, yeah, I, I just love, you know, yeah, it's, if you look on trailing financials, it looks expensive. But if you think about the opportunity and the skew there, I mean, my Lord, if they get it right. And there's no guarantee, but I, I think it's better odds than not. So, and, and, and that's one where, you know, it's just in terms of friction. So I, I actually, I, I own Angie through my yeah. IAC exposure. And, and one of the ways that I think about that is like, if you have the ability to partner with the best marketplace investor in the world, like take my money. Right. Like that's a frictionless, no cognitive load decision every single day of the week. And uh, and 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 that, that's where I'd like to find opportunities like that. Like Mark Leonard over at Constellation Software, there is no one better at buying vertical market software than that guy. And the, and the team that he's built and the, the organization that he's, he's built, the decentralization in that organization. So yep. there's so many different aspects to this. Right. Where I think this is what the fun part about investing in companies is it's not just financials. It's also culture. It's also uh, in, in, like uh, management practices. It's team topologies. It's, uh, it's friction within the user experience. There's so many different areas with which you can, you can kind of look at these companies. And once you coordinate them together, you can find really powerful kind of investments to make. Yeah, with Angie, and I've just been dying to say this point out loud, like, you know, four years ago, people were saying with match.com, they, they were like, oh, you'll never monetize this. Nobody's been able to do this before. It was like, it's, it's literally teenagers and 20 year olds looking to meet their life partner. Like if you can dominate that market, you're, it's going to be worth a fortune. Like you will find a way to make money if you can dominate that market. And I mentioned match because as you know, IAC controlled match at the time, this, they figured it out and the stock was up like, you know, probably five or six X and Angie's list right now, people are saying, Hey, you know, it's going to be tough to dominate home services. Like, well, they're growing requests by 20% per year. And like, you've got the best marketplaces investors. And by the way, they did it four years ago over the same objections with match. So not a guarantee, but I, I just love that setup. Anyway, I'll, I'll, any last words here or can we turn over to Shopify? Yeah, yeah, before, before actually we go, do, there's one ahead. other co component that I think is really interesting about, about match in particular. So you remember when match went down a lot because they said Facebook was gonna go into dating? Oh, I, I, it went from 60 to 35 inch a day because Facebook was really not dating, yeah. Right, so it got, it got cut in half because Facebook announced that they were going into dating. You know, what's really interesting, and, and actually, um, this is actually, I think Modest did another uh, uh, thing about this with, maybe it was Invest Like the Best Again, uh, where he kind of talked about, you know, sort of um, niche focus on, on, mm -hmm. on a core area being something where you can dominate, right? And, and frankly, you know, at Bold Start, we do that with infrastructure, we do that with enterprise software, and, and we see the benefits of that through the network effect of people, customers, talent, things like that that come to us, right? But what's interesting is, um, you know, a lot of people say like, okay, well, Facebook is going to blow up uh, 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 Match or um, AWS is now, you know, uh, with MongoDB did document DB, right? That's in that space. They did Elastic Search targeting Elastic. But what's, if you flip that around, why is AWS entering your market? Why is Facebook thinking about your market? probably the market size is a whole heck of a lot bigger than you originally thought. Right. And that's the, that's the powerful thing to me is like when these companies absolutely like they, they could, you have to start to, to really rethink the competitive positioning, the product positioning, all those sort of components. But at the same time, like it is a validation that there's something big here. And yeah. so you should probably explore that a little bit more. Right. So that's where I kind of flip that. I get, I get more excited when a large company says, Hey, we're targeting your area because then I'm just like, wow, okay, now game on. Like this is now a lot bigger than I originally thought because they're devoting resources to this. And I think there's that great slide where it's like the history of tech giants announcing that they're going to come into a market and like, you know, match.com, the stock's down 50% in the day that announces. And then two years later, like nine times out of 10, the stock's up like 
two or three hundred percent because the the giant was like they were just a second too late trying to get in there and you know uh focus dominates so anyway, let's turn over to the company speaking of focus i mean this is one of the great public market success stories over the past uh i'd say 10 10 ish years it, it was founded in 2004 but the company we want to talk about today is shopify uh why don't, why don't you just start give us a little background on shopify yeah, so so Shopify, you know, it's it's become one of those cult classics, I would say, right now, um, and 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 rightfully so, because basically, you know, what Shopify is able to do is, if you're any uh, any sort of entrepreneur, you wanna you wanna spin up a store where you could, you wanna sell goods. It could be tank tops, it could be sandals, or it could be something like you know elaborate lamps. Um, basically, Shopify can be your go-to uh, infrastructure to not only set up your e-commerce site, but also if you need a POS for your store, point of sale system for your, uh, for your retail store, if you need distribution, if you need a CRM software, if you need marketing, like everything, it's an all-in-one place for you to go to for all the resources set up your, your, uh, your retail uh, business. And so that's really powerful, right? Because um, one what does Shopify do, right? So yes, it's, it serves, uh, you know, the, the local cupcake shop that is uh, trying to sell their cupcakes, but also it serves me and you, right? So let's just say like, I, uh, you know, I just want to make t-shirts that, uh, that have my logo on them. Cause I think it'd be funny or something like that. Right. I'd wear one right now. If you were, I, I would wear it for the podcast, <laughs> but like, you know, I could just go and, and, and spin that up. Right. And, and, and start selling those t-shirts. And that's so powerful. Cause you're just, you're starting this new entrepreneurial spirit in a number of different people. Um, uh, and, and, and we'll go into some of the financials here, but like, that's, that's one of the funniest things. Like there was a short report that was like, Oh, um, Shopify churns a lot of customers. Well, no shit. It churns a lot of customers because it's like, if I started a store and, and I'm doing it as my, uh, my side hustle and if it doesn't work out, then yeah, I'm going to churn. But the, again, it goes to alignment of cost structure. How much did it cost to acquire Showmic as a customer? Right. And if it was just some SEO where I, I looked up, like, what's the easiest way to start a business? And then I popped open Google search and I saw uh, Shopify, that cost is not that much. Right. And so that's a very aligned co cost structure for something like that. So um, anyway, uh, just, you know, a brief overview of, of, of what no, that's great. So the brief overview is you want to build a store Shopify can, it's basically all in one for building an online storefront. Right. And I guess the thing that surprised me is, you know, I heard about it a couple years ago and to my chagrin, I didn't invest because maybe I thought like Shopify is a Canadian company. And I was like, oh, those Canadians, they love to talk about their national Canadian companies. But I, I looked at it and thought like, what's the different, you know, Shopify said we have a flywheel and some of their, especially the new businesses, I think they do. But I looked at it and said, what's the difference between like a Wix storefront and a Shopify storefront or you know, there are any number of competitors. So what is the Shopify flywheel? Why has Shopify been so successful and grabbing so much of the market? So uh, Shopify is one of the, my favorite, like, um, so people ask me like, where, what company did you learn a lot from? And what, what was the company that you learned the most from? And, you know, I would say obviously Berkshire, right? I learned a lot from things like that, but, but uh, Salesforce was probably one of the most influential for, for me in my SaaS journey, right? Uh, and then I learned a lot about concepts like distribution, things like that. I think the next generation is going to be studying Shopify and not mm -hmm. Salesforce. Uh, and part of the reason why is, is there's a confluence of trends that are happening that, that is creating this flywheel. So if you think about how Shopify first started, it was a truly bottoms up end user serving product, right? So again, me or you, login, transparent pricing, you can have the, the, the early plan, the advanced or, you know, a professional, and it's all right there. You know what's going to happen. You can just spin it up, boom, all of a sudden you're starting to sell your product, right? Okay, so that's great. That's, that's this sort of, you know, consumerization of IT that everyone starts to talk about. But now you talk, you, you think about, you know, Heinz ketchup or, um, or well, they're more than ketchup, but Heinz, uh, all these large brands are now going on to Shopify. How are they getting served? They're actually coming on to Shopify Plus, which is the enterprise offering. And there's a direct sales force that goes out and gets those leads, right? Yep. And so now you have an enterprise offer. You have a sales force like CRM sale that's happening within this thing that started from bottoms up, right? Which is just freaking fascinating, right? That, that they're b balancing both those business models. Um, did you have a question? Or? Yeah, no, 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 I agree. I, I 100% agree with you. But l let me just push back a little bit further. So you know, like three years ago, but even before Shopify Plus really got going, like, why, why was Shopify so successful in taking so much share versus the other competitors? You know, like, I, I, three years ago, I could have gone and done a Wix store, I could have done a Square store, I believe, like, why did Shopify take all the market? Because I think they've got like, as you said, seven or 8% of online retail at this point, right? Only Amazon is bigger. How did they grab this much? 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, what, what's interesting is, is, you know, you think about Wix or you think about um, Automatic, right, which is uh, WordPress is their open source and their they're the, they're enterprise version of that. Um, you know, yeah, they, they should have been able to, frankly, take uh, a lot more market share, but they also start off in a different way, right? They were serving users who wanted to uh, spin up a website, which was really hard before they came. Um, and yes, they're now moving into different areas, but still the core thing that they worked on and the core like kind of pain point that they came from was how do you uh, spin up a website? And that can be used for a variety of different things. It could be a financial website, it could be a resource, it could be yep. so many different ways. Um, so, you know, it, it's much more broad in nature. Now, if you look at how Shopify got started, uh, Toby, I think famously was selling snowboards or something. Uh, yeah, website, that's right. right. 2004 selling snowboards. Yeah. So he's selling snowboards. So this guy comes in, he's selling snowboards, uh, and he realizes like, Hey, you know, this, this, this could be a much more seamless experience if we had kind of these different components. Right. So he builds that out. He lived that pain point himself. He was selling his own snowboards. Right. And so now it's a much different experience, even from the design, the checkout, like everything that's tailored from, uh, from the, the initial Shopify website and the, and the structure is much different than Wix or automatic or anything like that, because it's not just a website builder. It's a website tailored for retail, right? Perfect. Because he's yep. lived that pain. And so again, that's where, uh, uh, he had a, he had a narrow focus. Uh, that he was focused on, he knew that pain really well, and then was able to quickly start to reach out to, to you know, fellow co-sellers and then spread virally because it was this easy to adopt uh, platform. And so that's yeah. where it's really powerful, right? It comes from that end user uh, pain that he experienced. No, that's great. Uh, so at this point, I mean, I think they are the, the dominant way if you're not kind of going on Amazon, they're the dominant way that you're gonna sell online. Uh, and if it was just that, Obviously, that's a huge market, but I think they've got tons of level up opportunities. So can you talk about all the different things that they're leveling up into and expanding into and how yeah. that kind of increases that flywheel? Yeah, so let's like, I think what's really core with, with Shopify is to understand all the different com components that are coming together. So you have bottoms up, you have a top down Shopify plus sale, right? Yep. You then have um, an ancillary product and payments that they've now tackled on to give like almost what I would call, you know, net dollar retention for a, for a, a, a SaaS company where you're, where you're selling kind of new products on top of your core product. That's sort of the, what they're doing with payments. But then now think about the other moves that they've made. One, there's like 30,000 uh, agencies and, 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 uh, um, and different kind of shops that help start, that help entrepreneurs get their Shopify uh, uh, store up and running. And so the, the corollary to this would be like Salesforce or ServiceNow, they work with a bunch of sy system integrators like Deloitte, Accenture, things like that to set up your instance. That's what's happening now in, in the Shopify ecosystem. And that is a huge flywheel because now you don't even need to invest those resources yourself. Other people are making money yeah. off of your plat by enabling your platform, right? You, you're now truly a platform. And so that's creating this flywheel effect. Um, and then they now have an app marketplace as well. So there's also upsell not only coming from the payments, but also from this app marketplace where there's developers creating stuff, Shopify is creating stuff internally. And then also they do some really interesting things. So this is where the capital allocation starts to play in where they, uh, I think kit CRM was something that I believe started on the Shopify marketplace. Um, but there was a couple other things that also, I think they bought from the Shopify marketplace. Anyway, if you think about that as a CRM product, um, it's interesting. They bought that product and then they actually bundled it into their offering. And so why would you do that, right? If you bought this thing, you paid a bunch of money, why would you bundle it into your core offering? Well, one, you increase the value of that bundle, right? And, and you're increasing the retention as well. Uh, but also, secondly, like what they've realized is, hey, uh, you know, a weak point in our offering may be that people don't have a, a, a customer, you know, portal to kind of track all their customer engagements and everything like yep. that. And, um, and so that may be a reason why if Wix maybe worked with someone and had a really tight integration, they might go over to Wix or they might go over to Square. Or they might go over to this, this other things, right? So they actually go out and buy one of the number one used uh, uh, CRMs on their platform and then just give it away for free in their bundle to, bundle to cement their place, right? And that's really where the powerful of, uh, nature of Shopify is coming from. They have all these different components that are working with them and they're thinking further ahead in terms of even capital allocation of where can we stave off competitors and improve the product offering. And so that's where I, it, it gets really exciting. Yeah. And, and one of the ones that I'll, I'll let you talk about a little bit, I think the coolest one that I saw because I see it and, you know, I, I think the biggest moat for Amazon is the logistics network and the shipping and just having all these warehouses built out in one day shipping. And I didn't think anyone would ever be able to come close to replicating that aside from maybe, maybe Walmart. 
but uh, you know, Shopify fulfillment, which I just think is the coolest thing for churn reduction. Anything. So maybe you could talk about that and how you kind of view that uh, that expansion. Yeah, you know, so it was funny because uh, they expanded into that, and then uh, I was like, okay, wow, this is really exciting. And then I was like, but wait, this is going to take a lot of money. Like, oh my god, this is going to take so much money. Like, how are you going to build this up? This distribution, like, it's you got all these warehouses. Like, this is just crazy. It's you're building a supply chain, right? Um, and then what, what's funny is, is kind of there's a reflexive component to this where the stock price kept on going up and then just, they just started selling stock. Yeah. So they raised something like $3 billion at great prices that now the, the, the capital of the entry is no longer a barrier, right? They have infinite amounts of capital now to pursue what is a major large market where again, now you can increase the value of your, your, your bundled offering, right? Where now you're just saying, hey, it is literally point and click or not even point and click, you can actually work with one of these distributors so that you don't even have to worry about. They will set up your Shopify store. All you need to worry about is, is designing your product. And then we can help you from the total supply chain of even working with your manufacturer, getting it shipped here, uh, getting it distributed to your customer. Everything will be handled by us um, and, and, and you don't have to worry about, right? And think about that. Again, we're, we're talking about decreasing cognitive load and decreasing friction to adopt. This is like the, 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 the easy, like, I can't think about any friction in this process. Like I'm, I'm struggling to even understand like where I would have trouble to adopt this because I could just work at work with an agency to then start uh, uh, using the product right away. So I think this is a really powerful concept and, and, and one of the things I'm really excited about for them in the future. Yeah, and it's funny you mentioned, hey, they announced that their stock keeps going up and they keep they can raise money at great prices. And, you know, it reminds me of in the late 90s, Jeff Bezos, when he was like the dot-com bubble crashes. And he says, this is great but because before, like my competitors could raise unlimited funds and like we had, we just had to spend on crazy stuff just to keep our moat. Now that no one else can raise money, like our moat is kind of cemented at this point. And for them, you know, the stock goes up, they can get all this capital and they can get into all these different ladder up opportunities. Yeah, it's, it's just interesting to me, right? Because like we, um, I think right now, I, I don't want to say everyone, but a lot of people are shying away from capital intensive models, right? Um, uh, because they're just like, oh, we want this asset light, you know, just 80% gross margins and stuff like that. And, and yep. you know, it's worked really well, but at the same time, also, as we all know, like multiples usually reflect that over time at least. And, and, and those will kind of, those should at least uh, come to some sort of steady state, right? In terms of future returns. But the interesting thing is like, now all of a sudden you have Shopify, which is asset light, going into a, a kind of asset heavy type business, right? Where they're, they're having to invest in, in logistics infrastructure. And, and maybe they won't own warehouses. I'll be curious to see if they actually go about that route. But like, even if they don't, it's still the robots, the, the, uh, the, the you know, all this different infrastructure that you need to set up to, to actually have that uh, occur you know, that's, that's capital intensive. And that's so, that's so interesting to have happen where an asset like business is raising enough capital to go into that thing because then that's going to further cement their moat. No, you know, it, it's such a good point. And it makes me think like we talked eye buying, right? And Zillow, which Zillow is super capital light, right? Like they just run some algorithms and put out his estimate and they're moving into, hey, we're actually going to invest our money to buy homes. Like that's maybe the most capital intensive business I could think of. Netflix, we're really capital light. We, we, <laughs> basically lease uh, stars' Disney movies and just show them to you and said, hey, we're going to go spend hundreds of millions of dollars building originals. So I do wonder, and it's something I'm going to think more about, like when an asset light business actually pivots into asset heavy, maybe that's a sign of both Moat, a visionary CEO, and that's actually where the real alpha can be generated. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting concept and it's something that, I, you know, would have to, I'd have to explore a little bit more as well. But it's just, it's, uh, I think one thing is if they have the capital to do so, without leverage, I would say, yep. um, if they have the capital to do so without leverage, you could have a really powerful outcome right there, right? Which could be exponentially higher than whatever we think. Because uh, again, now you just increase the power of that bundle. So you could not increase the lowest price because those entrepreneurs probably can't pay, but that middle tier could actually go up and the advanced tier could certainly go up. And then Shopify Plus just got a lot more, uh, uh, you know, expense, expensive on a, uh, a dollar basis. But in terms of value, as we know with bundles, like actually probably just went down for the utility of the of the customer. Well, look, here's the good news. We've got something we can talk about for years going forward, because from now on, whenever you and I see a, a company asset light pivoting to asset heavy, we're going to have to send a message and be like, this is our signal. We need to at least look at this uh, heavily. Let's talk about the bear case. You know, I, I think Shopify, you mentioned one of the bear cases, which I, I think you and a couple others did a great job of disproving was churn is high. Well, yeah, you're dealing with like startup businesses. Of course, churn is high. That's actually kind of a good thing. 
Uh, but I think the simplest bear case right now would be valuation. Shopify trades at 50X, not 50X earnings, not 50X EBITDA. It trades at 50X sales right now, right? Uh, that's a huge number for any company. And Shopify, it's not like it's a startup, you know, it's almost 20 years old at this point. So tell me why 50X sales at this point is not too expensive for Shopify. Yeah, so um, uh, again, I, I would say 50X sales is not, so I, I don't think it's expensive from a absolute value uh, valuation perspective. I do think it could be expensive from a relative valuation perspective. But again, the question then becomes, what's your holding time then, right? So now your holding time probably just got longer in terms of how much you're willing to pay ahead of, 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 of revenue and of, of uh, free cash flow in the future. For me, the reason why I think it's still actually an attractive uh, valuation for, you know, let's say five years out is because, um, First of all, one, we, we haven't really seen many businesses with this many different, you know, kind of confluences of, of, uh, of business models that are all hitting it at once, creating this mode around this business, right? And I think, you know, uh, uh, what's that Charlie Munger Lollapalooza quote? Like, when you see a bunch of things happening, like, there's probably something that's working there. And, yeah. and I, don't un I don't know how to, like, handicap the magnitude of what that could be because we just haven't seen it before. Right. It's something that's still a relatively new thing in terms of business models to structure when you have all these different things that are coming together. The second thing is, is again, 7% market share of the U.S. Uh, uh, e-commerce market. Right. Um, that could certainly go up. But then also you have international and you have all these different areas. So like it's one of the largest markets you can think about. E-commerce is is the largest retail is the largest you know market we, we can think about. Right. And so uh, serving those customers like from an absolute valuation basis, I don't know, 100 billion is not much in the grand scheme of like $5 trillion yeah. of spent, right? No, I, I would only push back on one thing you said. We, we haven't seen this Lollapalooza effect before. And like, I think we've compared this to Amazon like 15 times at this point, right? And I, I think that that comparison makes a lot of sense. If this is Amazon 2.0, you know, you say, hey, hey it's 100 billion, it's 50 XLs. Well, run this forward 10 years. If this is Amazon 2.0, like, wouldn't you want to buy into Amazon at a hundred billion dollar valuation? And like, you, you can see a, a lot of different stickier things. And as we mentioned, like it's 50 X trailing sales, but what if they can get into two more things, right? They're doing shipping. What if they build out the next UPS or something? Like there's just a lot of level up things. So I, I do think we've seen a Lollapalooza like this before. And as we say it, it just reminds me so much of Amazon. So Amazon though, I would say just, you know, kind of uh, you read Ben Thompson, like Stratechery. Yep. Um, so, you know, I would say Amazon is, is, has a, a bunch of different businesses in it, but, but, you know, probably core Amazon, what we think of is an aggregator. And then the actual platform is AWS and what Shopify yeah. is in the platform. It's not an aggregator. Right. Um, and so I think there's, there's kind of different components where it's almost like more of looking at what Microsoft is doing as a corollary or what AWS is doing as a corollary to what Shopify is doing. Right. Yeah. I don't disagree with you, but you know, AWS was spun, was spun out like Amazon retail needed all of this computing right. services. They, and like when I was, I was reading the Shopify, I think it was the 2018 investor day to prep for this and Shopify fulfillment. One thing they said was, Hey, we dog fooded this by the Shopify hardware we send out. That was our first customer. And like, that was such an, that was such an Amazon sounding thing that they did. And like, maybe they are an aggregator right now, but you can see how the platform comes out of the aggregator at some point with a CEO like this and a platform like this. Yeah. So, I mean, but I think the bear case, there's, there's a couple different things, right? Go so ahead. I, I was going to ask more on the bear case. Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. So, so one is a bear case is uh, the competitive landscape is evolving, right? Uh, Square is not sitting on their ass. Wix yep. is not sitting, right? They are making changes. Um, Big commerce also just came out. I, I think their offering is, is, is not quite up to snuff with, with, with Shopify. So I, I don't, you know, anyway, I won't, I won't go into that, but, but, but basically what I would say is um, uh, I think, uh, I think Shopify has a strong product lead and also a strong business model lead at this point. But at the same time, there's a bunch of other uh, players out there with different entry points that could still figure out uh, different ways to do the same thing that Shopify is doing. Yeah. And the question is, is the entry point that they're doing like Square with, with easiest uh, uh, POS systems out there, like is that the best entry point to go into uh, this, this you know, category, right? And it's still unclear on that. So that's one thing uh, in just terms of the competitive moves that these other uh, companies are making, that's a potential bear case because then that could change Shopify's uh, competitive position in the future. The other bear case is um, MailChimp has had a pretty public falling out uh, with, uh, with Shopify, right? And, and MailChimp itself is kind of starting to, you know, build out its own offering, right? Um, it's also starting to partner with other players. And so that's something where if some of these best of breed players start to say, hey, Shopify, you're encroaching on our turf, or for some reason, we don't like working with you. 
um, that can actually damage the moat, right? Because uh, while they do have all these things bundled, still a lot of customers want to choose best of breed tooling and MailChimp is probably one of the best, uh, you know, email subscription things out there. Um, and so if, if that goes away and the, the integration is not as tight there, that's also a bear case to, uh, to the product offering that Shopify can offer their, their customers, which then could lead to more churn, right? Um, and, then, and then I think the third thing on valuation is, is you know, for me, I, I struggle with, again, I think it would, it would all depend on time frame. So it's hard to say of like the bear case because absolutely I could make a bear case for next year, Shopify getting uh, uh, cut in half, right? And then you being like, oh, I'm down 50%, right? But the question depends on your holding period. Like if your holding period is three to five years, I start to think that actually you can, you can see some pretty attractive dynamics here because I'll give an example, net new customers are being added to their base. My parents have never done online shopping ever, right? They, they don't even like, they have phones, they don't use laptops, right? So it's all through mobile. But recently through this crisis, what has my mom been doing? She pops open her phone and starts being like, oh, this is a cool watch. Well, guess who sells that, who, who that watch is sold on? Sell, sold on the Shopify platform, right? Yep. And so that's where this net new is being created. So absolutely, there'll probably be some sort of reversion uh, when we kind of go back to normal, whenever that is but still there's net new uh, behavior that's being created that will stick around for a long time. Yeah. No. And look, I, I hear you on, it's all about time frame. Like personally, I, I want to buy a business that five years from now, you know, it's going to be worth two X what I'm paying for today. Something along those lines. Like I just think the most boring thesis is are, Hey, this trades for 25 times. And I think it's actually worth 20 times, right? Like that's what my DCF model spits up. I think that's the most boring short thesis. And I think it's also been disproven. You know, I, we talked about Salesforce, which you said was your, your case study. Like, I remember so many people were like, Salesforce trades at a hundred times earnings. Like there's no way a company could ever justify that. Like you know, Salesforce, you know, 5X since then. I, you know, so many people were short Amazon and Netflix, a lot, some of them for competition, but a lot of them, hey, these trade at nosebleed valuations. And guess what? They're best of breed businesses run by the best CEOs in the industries. And both of them found a way, you know, I, I think Shopify's got a lot of that. Let me ask just real quickly, one competitor that isn't, I'm a little surprised by is Facebook, right? And I think Facebook and Shopify actually announced a partnership. And I had always kind of thought like, this is a natural area for Facebook, right? They've got a lot of capital they can invest. You could run a Facebook website with Facebook handling all the back end. Like, I'm just a little surprised with that. So can you talk about why Facebook isn't a competitor in the Facebook partnership? So um, I think uh, I think the reason why is there, there's some cultural aspects to it, right? Um, and, and I, you know, again, it's it's hard to, these are all different things that you have to take from different resources and, and synthesize your viewpoint, right? But there's a there's a book on, uh, I think it's called No Filter um, on, on the story of Instagram that came out. It's a really fascinating read, but basically, you know, it talks about how um, Mike Krieger and Kevin Systrom, their, their company was bought uh, and, and how it goes through, you know, just what they experienced within the Facebook organization. And uh, a lot of things that, that at least that book talks about is how everything was tailored to how are you going to keep big blue alive right so if you think about stories stories natively work really well within uh, uh within instagram yep. but stories are now everywhere right they're in the big blue app as well and uh and, and uh, you know I, I assume people are, are are engaging with it but it's just something that uh you know originally was supposed to be in instagram right and, and you can see now how cross posting and stuff happens and so when you think about that being like kind of the core uh, uh tissue of this um, it gets to be a little bit more challenging because if you're going to start to now build uh, Facebook pages for, for businesses and then start to set up this whole retail business around it, um, well, that's going to detract away from the user experience of bringing people together and, and groups and all that, right, within the core Big Blue app. Yep. And so, you know, that's something where I imagine, you know, Zuck probably isn't that happy about, right, and, and it's not something that he wants to do about. So there's a cultural barrier to that. Now, Instagram, though, is super interesting. And that's one to watch, right? Because I do Agreed. think that they have with the influencer trend with people already, you know, conditioned to look at things, click on what they're looking at, and then go to that store. Um, and, and now sort of be more of an affiliate model, they should be able to turn that into more of a direct model where you can purchase right away. Um, the question there becomes like, can Shopify provide a frictionless enough experience such that uh, Facebook doesn't want to build out Shopify's offering on their own, right? And yeah. I think for now, um, that's not their focus, right? They're still focused on growing users, on connecting users, on making it more of a seamless experience. And right now, the, seam the most seamless way is you connect to Shopify and they'll handle uh, uh, all these different aspects of, of the business. 
Um, and then over time, you know, they'll start to take some share like Facebook pay or, or whatever they're calling it. Like they're, they're going to come out with their own uh, payment platform. And that I think could, you know, be a detriment to some of Shopify's payment revenue. Yep. So that would be interesting to watch, but it's just how tightly can they integrate it? What does the user experience look like? That's something we'll still have to watch as, as it goes forward. And, and, and look, I think this goes back to the level up opportunities can be very profitable, but it's also about building the moat out, right? Like if Shopify, if they're only the core Shopify website experience, Facebook can eventually replicate that. But if they've got all your customer relationship management on there and they own all the data, and by the way, you're doing all your shipping and warehousing and stuff through them, like that's a lot more expensive, a lot more time consuming, a lot more headache for Facebook to look at. So I think uh, all that's it. Uh, last thing I want to talk about, um, Shopify CEO, Toby. Uh, back in 2018, somebody tweeted, hey, I think Amazon will buy Shopify in 2019. And Toby responded, I'd rather buy Amazon in 2029. Now, I I'm pretty sure he was joking i don't think there's any chance regulators would let that happen but you know, the, what does that tweet tell you about him and ju just kind of dive into him for a second because i think he's a revolutionary ceo that not a lot of people are super familiar with maybe because he's canadian so so uh you know i think every single interview that uh i've at least heard about him he's extraordinarily thoughtful about org design about uh about how to make sure you know one of the things i, I think is, is fascinating about the most uh the best capital allocators over time is if you think about the way that they look at things, it's it's mostly org design, right? It's how do you decrease the uh, the ability to get bad news up to uh, where decisions need to happen, and also empower uh, different folks to make decisions when they need to, and and that's where Toby is completely. That's his whole trust battery thing, right? If you have a certain trust level, like by all means, at that point, you you go make your decisions and and you know make them quickly, right? And this is the same thing that Mark Leonard does at Constellation or even Berkshire, right? Berkshire centralizes capital allocation decisions from you know, a hold co level, but then each of these uh, individual companies is kind of just told like, hey, you're completely decentralized. Kind of go, different. yeah, yeah. Right? And so I think that's, that's fascinating that Toby has kind of, um, is studying all this org design and, and, and building that into, uh, his, you know, into his company. But the second thing about Toby though is, you know, uh, there's an interesting thing that's happening right now with, with influencers in, in the entrepreneurship world, right? And uh, right now there's a huge war for talent. I'll even say from, from our companies that we're working with, right? To hire an engineer or to hire a developer relations person or stuff like that, it's a battle. It's a, you know, you're, you're going to war with like other companies because um, everyone has capital. They all are able to pay. So it's really about the vision and, and the opportunity and the responsibility. Toby yep. goes out there, plays StarCraft online. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was gonna use the same anecdote, go ahead. Please. Yeah, like he goes out there, he plays StarCraft. He's like he's like the LeBron James of 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 Twitter, right? Like he's literally he goes, he messes he jokes around with people, he quote tweets funny stuff, he he pokes humor at himself, right? And all of this engenders this ability within Shopify for others to express themselves as well. And so one of the interesting things is if you look at different Shopify employees' tweets, they're literally celebrating like we've been here for five years, we've been here for eight years, we've been here, you know, ten years, right? That is crazy that they're just, you know, one, that they've stayed that long, but also two, that they're just like going out there and, and they're celebrating it, right? And everyone else is like, can't wait to hit my one year milestone or can't hit to wait, wait to hit my two year, right? So you're attracting more talent, you're attracting the best talent to your company, because you're out there. And, and you, everyone's like, wow, I want to work with Toby, because he's this amazing person. No, the coolest one I thought was, uh, he played StarCraft, as you said, and if I remember correctly, there was, you know, a 20 year old StarCraft, basically professional player, who was looking for an internship and toby said hey we'll give you you'll have an internship and i love that the the uh starcraft player didn't know who toby was so it was like oh great cool but who are you like how how can you give me a shop by internship but i just love like you know this guy yeah maybe he's not your traditional business candidate but he has exhibited like talent drive expertise like i know still a lot of people probably scoff at esports players but like it is hard hard work there's a lot of training uh a lot of uh kind of what's the practice what's the zero to ten the zero to ten thousand thing like uh concentrated practice or mindful practice or whatever like oh, yeah, if you're gonna yeah. be a pro you need that and he's exhibited that skill set and i'm sure that guy if you give him six months in any organization i'm sure he's gonna be fantastic and like toby was hiring for talent not for fit right now but for talent and fit three years out and i just think that speaks to a a, a great leader anything else on shop fire or anything you want to talk about before we wrap up you know i i um i don't really think so i i, I would just say like uh you know, again, this is a, 
I think it's really hard to, to comprehend the market size here because uh, as we talk about other companies like starting to target this area, right? Shopify was the first mover, but then now you have all these like, like Square, uh, different entry point, but now realizing like, whoa, there's a lot to do here, right? Um, we'll see if, if, you know, kind of what Stripe does in the future too, right? As they start to look at different things. Um, and I think it's just really validating that this is a huge market. So uh, in terms of the size of how big this could be, now you start, have to start thinking about like, okay, well, what's the global market share that a company like Shopify could get? And then what are the blockers to them getting that? And if you know those blockers, then you can start to handicap what's the risk that they're going to be able to remove that, right? And so um, that's kind of where I focus my time with Shopify is like, okay, well, um, how do they get to 15% market share? Well, I know Amazon's doing this. I know, I know Square's doing this. Hmm, okay, what do I think about the thesis where they're approaching? Oh, that's interesting that they're now like bundling in kit CRM. They're bundling in, you know, marketing automation tools. They're bundling all this stuff in. I can see how they're starting to move into these adjacent areas that could start to, to, to get, help them get that market share. So that's where I would just say, like, that's the focus and the, the level of detail that you almost need to dive into to truly understand these companies at these valuations. Perfect. Well, look, uh, I, I'm going to say it again. I, I've learned so much from the Minion Capital account uh, over the years. It's, it's great to put a, a face to a Twitter handle. And, you know, this has been even more enlightening than I thought it was. Uh, anytime you've got a new SaaS company or one of your portfolio companies goes public or anything, you're going to have a standing invite because this was great. I'll put the link so everybody can follow you guys in this, you in the description, which they absolutely should. But, uh, hey, thanks so much for coming on and we'll be in touch. Yeah, thanks uh, to you as well. And I, I love yet another value blog and, and all that you're doing. So please keep doing what you're doing. I will. Appreciate it, man. All right. See ya.